Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome everybody to tonight's UC Connect lecture. My name is Wendy Lawson and I'm here to um, introduce the lecture. I'm the Prime Vice Chancellor in, of the College of Science here at the University of Canterbury. And my only job tonight really is to hand over to Anne and let her do her magic. Now, I will um, give a very brief introduction to our speaker tonight, Dr. Anne Brower. Um, Anne is a, an American citizen by birth, although I'm very pleased to say that she's recently taken out her New Zealand citizenship. She did, um, she's from North Carolina in the US, um, but she did most of her education in California. She got a BA from Pomona College in Southern California, followed by a, a Master's of Forestry Science from Yale University, and an MA and a PhD from Berkeley that you've probably heard of. Um, Anne originally came to New Zealand as a Fulbright Scholar, and probably you'll have heard of the Fulbright Scholarship Scheme. She came to Lincoln University as a Fulbright Scholar, um, and I'm putting words into Anne's mouth now, fell in love it, with New Zealand, decided to stay much to New Zealand's um, benefit. Um, there have been many defining moments in Anne's career, and um, Anne is going to talk about one of those tonight. Um, Anne was in the bus on Colombo <coughs> Street, um, onto which an unsupported stone facade collapsed um, in the earthquake at 10 to 1 on the 22nd of February. And that led to a range of events, not least was some of them were um, a very significant medical situation for Anne. She survived that event, but many of the people in the bus didn't. And I think she's going to talk about that in some more detail tonight. And I think she's also going to talk about her, her engagement and involvement in the various processes that took place after that event. I'd also like to mention one other um, significant moment in Anne's career, and in fact that's taken place today. Um, some of us in the audience, um, including Anne herself and myself, um, have just come from an event at which Anne has been awarded the 2017 Critic and Conscience of Society Award from the University of New Zealand, sponsored by... Thank you. Spontaneous applause. What can you hope for? So that award is sponsored by the Gamma Foundation, of which um, the sponsors of the foundation are here tonight in the front row, Grant Nelson and Marilyn Nelson, welcome, and the judge, um, Steve Weaver, who I'm sure that some of you will know. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what that was for, for Steve. Um, yeah, nothing wrong with that, Steve. Um, so I'm just I'm very shortly going to hand over to Anne, just a few housekeeping matters, as you can imagine. The um, bathrooms, if anybody needs those, are just, if you go out of here and then turn left. Um, I have some instructions here. Um, if you hear the fire alarm, please follow UC staff instructions, and I guess that's probably going to be me shouting at you about what to do. And, and follow, follow me to the evacuation point. <laughs> Um, which is in the Clyde car park on the east of the building. Um, the, we're going to now hear from Anne, as I say, who's, who's had a, this very special recognition today. Um, Anne is going to talk for around about 40 minutes. She tells me she's timed us at home and it's 37 minutes. There will be plenty of time for questions. And Vicky is going to help with the questions by running around with a microphone so that everybody can hear the question before Anne gives her answer. So um, I'll stand up at the end and kind of, um, when you put your hands up, I'll Vicky will run and give the microphone to you. So please join me after congratulating Anne warmly for her award tonight. Please join me in welcoming her to talk to us this evening. for sharing your evening with me. It, can, anyone, can everyone hear? Okay. Um, so 
These days, we tend to hear a lot about what's wrong with the world. And tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to change the world, how to make the world just a little bit better, just a bit, little bit closer to right. It might be just a small aspect of a small corner of the world, but we've got to start somewhere. And much of a university education is a call to arms, and if it's not, it should be. So tonight, I'm here to give you um, a few arms to respond to the call whenever you might receive your call. I received my call to arms when I was a passenger on this bus. Twelve people uh, died on or beside this bus from Sumner to the University of Canterbury. Sixteen people died and one was paralyzed on that one block. I was the thirteenth person on the bus. I broke too many bones to count, spent two months in the hospital, took six months off work, and it took a further 18 months to get back to running, jumping, and playing the fiddle. And I still feel the earthquake in every step. Such an experience tends to be rather life-changing. In my case, it changed me from an economically oriented geographer focusing on South Island high country land reforms into a somewhat reluctant activist for a law reform of unreinforced masonry buildings in New Zealand. So tonight, I'm going to share a few of the lessons that I've learned on making a difference. These lessons come just as much from failures to make a difference as successes. But let's start with the su successes. So at 12.51, uh, as Wendy mentioned, on February 22nd, I was reading a magazine um, on my way to the University of Canterbury. I felt the bus jump in the air, watched bricks fly, heard them hit the roof, and then I felt myself being crushed brick by brick, pound by pound, and bone by bone. During that experience, I passed through the gates of hell, visited the dark place, and shrank from the bright light. I heard and felt the involuntary death throes of a 14-year-old boy, a 78-year-old woman, and 12 others in between. My leg, my hand, and my soul will never be the same. When I entered the dark place, I did what any rational person would do. I screamed at the top of my lungs. A sizable gang of kind souls had already started gathering um, around the bus, and my scream um, gathered a few more. Um, and they had already started clearing the rubble off the bus. But when I screamed, they stopped. Um, and they quickly sent down an emissary to ever so politely ask me to please shut up. <laughs> and that's when a man called Mike appeared outside my window. And he repeated over and over again, we're going to get you out, we're going to get you out, we're going to get you out. And they did. None of the men who uh, dug me out was a professional first responder, but they did an extraordinary thing that day. And I will say that one of them is here tonight, but I won't point him out. They dug a meter of bricks off the collapsed roof of the bus, ripped the roof off the bus with their bare hands, crawled into the bus, freed my left leg from underneath the bus seat, crushing it, lifted me out, laid me down in the middle of Colombo Street, splinted my left leg, flagged down a truck, which you can see here, uh, convinced the driver of the truck to take us to hospital, and convinced him, I might add, to go the wrong way down Tuam Street. Um, and they parted the already gridlocked traffic going in the opposite direction, um, told me stories in the back, and delivered me to Christchurch Public Hospital. The rest of Christchurch had to wait for USAR to mobilize from all around the world, but I had my very own and search and rescue. My friends like to call them ASAR. And we mustn't forget a man called Rob, who is not in this photo. Um, as the boys were clearing the rubble, he crawled into the bus and took it upon himself to hold my hand. The dark shadows in his eyes told me in no uncertain terms that I mustn't look around me. So I didn't. I looked only at Rob, who had somehow crawled into my small pocket of crushedness. 
Rob quickly ascertained that I was a keen tramper and a general lover of the outdoors. So he told me his favorite fishing stories while we waited to be dug out. At that moment, I went from being crushed, trapped, and alone to just being crushed and trapped. So while most of uh, Christchurch went without power and water for weeks, I was holding court in um, Christchurch Public and Burwood Hospitals, and I had lots of visitors. I tried to get John Key to bring pizza, but he didn't. Um, and a week after getting off crutches in June 2011, I received a text message from the hospital saying that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was uh, requesting the honor of my company in Ward 20 of Christchurch Hospital that day. Um, that is the only day that I skipped physio. Um, so the Dalai Lama's visit um, helped me and five other seriously injured survivors start to make peace with the pain. Three of us were in wheelchairs and one was still on bed rest. His Holiness told us that we should let go of the shoulda, woulda, couldas that haunt the survivors. The point isn't that we could have died. The point is that we didn't die. Strongly but gently, the Dalai Lama empowered us to give something to the world. We all had something, he said, but we just needed to, to traverse the pain and anger. And if we allowed that pain to become a part of us, the anger would subside. And that would give room for each of us to give our something to the world. About a week after the Dalai Lama's visit, my something became clear. The government announced that they were going to launch this Royal Commission of Inquiry, and so I set myself a goal of changing the Building Act. Um, because I had learned, by that point I had learned, that um, the most risky earthquake-prone buildings, the buildings that were designated as earthquake-prone, were not actually included in New Zealand's Building Act. So the most dangerous buildings were not regulated at all. So later in 2011, I was invited, but not required, to testify at the Royal Commission. As I prepared, um, I read through the six inches of, of evidence that they prepared um, for the Royal Commission. As I read through that six inches, it was hard to avoid the conclusion that Parliament, the building owners, and the City Council had, each in their own way, left us there to die. The building and hundreds of others like it in Christchurch and thousands across New Zealand had been expected to collapse for over 30 years. It wasn't the building that killed the people on the bus. It, uh, sorry, it wasn't the earthquake that killed the people on the bus. It was the building, decisions about the building, and the failure to enforce those decisions. In the Royal Commission, um, all of the building owners testified. And the building that collapsed onto us was divided into four different addresses, but it was all one building. And they were owned by two different owners. And the owner of the first three addresses um, said that he wasn't required to tie back his facade before or after September, um, so he didn't. But the owner of the fourth address testified that he, after September, he strapped with steel his building and as a result, his building still failed, but it didn't hurt anyone. It collapsed inward rather than outward. And uh, strapping his building cost $180,000, he said. And being a bit of a numbers person, I went straight home and issued an Official Information Act request to uh, the Health Service and ACC, asking how much it cost to save my left leg. And they wrote back and said that my left leg has cost you and everyone else in New Zealand $517,000.54, approximately. <laughs> um, I also looked up the, building, the value of the building itself, which was $30,000. So in December 2012, the Royal Commission issued its recommendations. And in those recommendations, they clearly recommended prioritizing the folly offy bits of buildings that fell onto our bus. The next day, the Ministry of, of um, building, 
Business Innovation and Employment, um, otherwise known as MB, um, the ministry issued its first proposal for changes to the Building Act. Um, and they placed no priority on the Falioffi bids. Um, and the minister, uh, Morris Williamson at the time, the Minister of Building and Construction, he did admit that the Royal Commission recommendations had gone a little bit further than the government's proposals. So soon after those proposals, um, lots of engineers and seismologists and hangers-on like me started a journey of trying to inspire policy change. We didn't know it at the time, but we were all on the same team. So in New Zealand, the public is invited, we all get to submit our ideas on a proposed government policy at least twice. So we get to submit when the ministry makes a proposal, and we also get to submit um, during the parliamentary select committee phase. Um, at the time that um, these things were going through a little bit further, uh, the minister changed and it became Nick Smith, who was also the Minister of Environment, which, as Wendy has noted, is my day job. So in the run-up to the parliamentary submissions, I learned all I could about buildings and earthquakes in order to write the best submission that I knew how. So in my first submission to Parliament, I tried to change the question. I knew that the building owners would talk about the costs of retrofitting, which are um, substantial. So I talked about the costs of not retrofitting and also about who pays those costs. Because the taxpayers paid to save my left leg, thank you very much, I do treasure that left leg, um, we, the taxpayers, had paid all of those health costs in dollars. I had paid the costs of not retrofitting the building uh, with time in hospital, and the other passengers had paid the costs of not retrofitting with their lives. And so that, that's quite a lot of subsidy for one building with a government valuation of $30,000. So in my submission to Parliament, I talked about the, the three E's of policy, which in general, we want policy to be uh, efficient, effective, and equitable. Um, and subsidies to owners of dangerous buildings within 200 kilometers of the Alpine Fault are economically in, inefficient and generally unfair or unequitable. So combining all of that, I told Parliament that I thought that we should fix the parapets, the gables, the chimneys, and all the other folly off bits first, not because that's what fell onto our bus, but because they are the cheapest to fix, they're the first to fall, and they're the deadliest when they do fall. And as it happened, um, many of of the kind souls who rescued me off of Colombo Street that day were engineers and builders. And many of them knew and shared my passion for changing the law. So several engineering firms um, worked with me and asked to um, sort of help me with the details of, of my submission and then asked to use parts of my submission in their submissions. And the City of Christchurch also asked as I knew that there would be many building owners who um, would be arguing the opposite to what we were saying, I shared my submission early and often with anyone who asked and even uh, many who didn't ask, like all of the good people of Christchurch and Auckland by submitting it to the newspapers. Um, so anyone who submits to Parliament, as you can see there on the left, um, if we say we wish to be heard, uh, we can be heard by Parliament, and we all we each get five minutes. So for five my, uh, my five minutes, I used cold-hearted political strategy, thinly veiled in emotion. I told Parliament that I did not envy their task, that they would hear a lot from the economic interests of building owners, but the voices for public safety would always be quieter. I told them that they were not likely to hear from many of the victims of the earthquake because being crushed by a building is not an empowering experience. It doesn't do wonders for the confidence. The voices of the dead and injured 
would be quiet at best. So I pleaded with the committee to listen to the voices that they would never hear and to hear those who have no voice, because sometimes those with the least ability to speak have the most to say. So a few months later, when the select committee reported out the changes they'd made to the bill, there was still no provision for masonry, parapets, and the folly off bits buildings. And I first heard about this from a reporter um, up in the Fort Hills, and I thought, oh well, at least I tried. The following week, um, a few days later, there was an earthquake in Dunedin. And a colleague and friend uh, told me that I simply must write another opinion piece. And I said, but John, it's done. There's nothing left to say. He said, it doesn't matter, Anne. Write it anyway. Tell Parliament they're wrong. So I did. And New Zealand being a, a small country, I saw my local MP, Ruth Dyson, at the farmer's market that weekend. She had seen my opinion piece in the Otago Daily Times, and she told me in no uncertain terms that I simply must send it to Clayton Cosgrove, who was another local MP. He's on the select committee, she said. And I said, but Ruth, it's done. There's nothing left to say. You know, they've reported out, they've made their changes. It's not there. It's done. And uh, if you've ever met the Honorable Ruth Dyson, you'll know that she is not one to be disobeyed. And she got quite stern with me and said that I must send it that day. And so, so I did. And the following Tuesday, three days later, the select committee announced another round of hearings. So again, in the second round, there was a lot of working together to, on submissions between the engineers and basically all of us on, on the same side. We drilled into our most important points and applied those points to the changes that Parliament had already proposed. So this time I tried to push emotion to the side and focus on pragmatism. And I said I couldn't understand why a safety conscious and fiscally conservative government would do anything other than fix the most dangerous bits first and leave the rest for later. The second round of select committee hearings fell right in the middle of the semester. And so once again, I got five minutes to speak to the committee. But this time I had to do it by phone in between classes. So I gave it my best shot and I crossed my fingers, but I did not hold my breath. And um, a month later, and about two weeks before the select committee was due to report out for the second time, I got a phone call um, from a business reporter at uh, the NBR, the National Business Review. She was all fired up and she was writing a series of articles about the Building Act. And she was going through all of the submissions and writing an article summarizing all of the different positions. Um, because although the Building Act doesn't, it sounds a bit of a dry topic, it was actually quite controversial because there's a lot of buildings in New Zealand and they're worth a lot of money. And so changes to the regulations about buildings are, are quite a big deal. So the NBR was writing a series of, of articles about this. Oh, great. So with a speck of hope, I rang up a friend in Wellington to see if the minister, Nick Smith, was coming onto our side. Uh, following the pressure from the NBR. He said, not a chance. And I said, oh, okay. So I had a slightly bruised speck of hope, and I noticed that Nick Smith was due to um, speak at a conference that following Friday. And I was also due to attend that same conference because it was about the environment, which again is my day job. Um, and it was a snowy August weekend, and I didn't have any plans, um, so I dusted the bruises off my speck of hope and wrote one last opinion piece and sent it to the press and the New Zealand Herald. And they both published it, and it was up to them to publish the same words, and there's no plagiarism rules in, in, in this game, I discovered. <laughs> um, so I knew that... Um, at, at the conference, I knew the minister's private secretary for environment uh, because of previous work I had done on, on land reform. So I asked him, could I get five minutes with the minister? And he said, you just want to talk to him about buildings, don't you? And I said, yep, absolutely. 
And so I got my five minutes with, with the minister, and he said that he empathized with the idea of equity, that parapets are a danger to those outside, not inside. And so my hopes rose. I thought, yes, it's coming on sides with us. But then they fell flat when he said that he didn't see much of a difference between a parapet and an air conditioning unit. And um, my hopes also rose when he said that he had an open mind to other ideas. And then they fell flat uh, 20 minutes later when he said he had an open mind about 47 times during his 30 minute speech at the conference. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, at least I tried. And the following week, I got a phone call from the minister's office um, from his private secretary for buildings. And he asked, might I have time to have coffee with the minister on Friday? He said, oh yes, thank you. I think I'll fit that into my schedule. And so that Friday, uh, I had an hour long meeting with the minister in, um, in an inner city cafe here in Christchurch. And he told me that he had halved the, um, he had halved the required time for fixing parapets and other falling off bits of buildings um, in the highest two categories of seismic risk in, in the country. And he said that the select committee was going to report out the following week, and might I be available to um, announce the changes with him. And I hadn't got exactly all that I had asked for, but I had got most, and I thought that most was pretty good. So I invited a couple of my rescuers to come with me to meet the minister and to announce the changes. And for that, I had to miss an hour of class. Um, and then a year later, on, uh, in May 2016, I flew up to Wellington to watch Parliament pass the Building Act, complete with uh, the two-line section uh, that the Minister calls the Brower Amendment that prioritizes the falling off bits of buildings. So after festering for about five years with neither cross-party nor public support, the changes from those two rounds of select committee transformed quite a contentious bill into one that passed 120 to 1. Um, the ACT Party said it was unempathetic. But the MPs who spoke to the bill, except for um, the ACT Party, uh, the MPs who spoke to the bill were visibly proud to work together to listen to the public that they serve and the scientists who they fund. And uh, during the parliamentary dinner break, Nick Smith took me to dinner in the cafeteria and he bought me sticky date pudding to celebrate. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I gotta say, changing the Building Act was not in my life plan, um, but extraordinary events can change ordinary life plans. And it's possible that the Dalai Lama knew what he was talking about when he said that the key to healing is finding our something and giving it to the world. So years before, the buildings came onto my radar, South Island High Country land reform had already taught me a lot about politics and policy and how the little guy can make a difference every once in a while. Um, but I'll give you a spoiler alert, the High Country story does not have such a happy ending just yet. Hope's spring eternal though. Um, so when I arrived on the si South Island, um, I was surprised to discover that the government had been selling crown land on the shores of beautiful mountain lakes. The pr surprising bit was that they were losing millions of dollars while selling the shores of Lake Tekapo, Wanaka, Wakatipu, and the rest. So when I wrote my report to, to Fulbright at the end of my year, I managed to spend 108 pages saying that basically when the crown sells land, the crown should make money. Well, it turns out that no one was happy with these findings. Um, North and South magazine called me the chirpy antichrist. And uh, National Farming Lobby said that I was unworthy of a PhD and that I should be banned from public speaking. Um, a year or two later, an environmental group took the crown to court and lost. But then after years of controversy, the then Minister of Lands, David Parker, changed the policy. Yes, victory. But then about 12 months later, uh, the new minister changed it straight back to what it was before. 
So here we are a decade <coughs> later, and I'm still waiting to make a difference in the high country. Nearly every week for the past year, we've seen a news story about land use intensification in the Mackenzie Basin. This month, these landscape changes made television both on HBO in the USA and TVNZ last night. Um, if we look at land use change since I started work on the high country, it's fair to conclude that the vistas, the flora, and the fauna of the Mackenzie Basin have got worse, not better. So since I started, um, you can see here that nearly in the, these green bits here, nearly a third of the basin outside of the parks have um, intensified in land use. The next question is, so who, who owns the land that's intensifying? About one third of, uh, so this purple land here is, has been freeholded through this high country land reform. And about, um, about a third of the new freehold has intensified in land use. So you can see the sort of darker purple. Um, and then on, the photo there is uh, the top of Lake Benmore station. I'm uh, sorry, Lake Benmore. And that's a former pastoral lease that has now been um, intensified. So you can see quite clearly the irrigation circles and the cropping in place. So then you look at land that has not yet gone through these, these pastoral reforms. And that's the yellow land in, in this map. Um, and you can see in the sort of brighter green inside the current pastoral leases that actually quite a lot of the land that's still under crown control has intensified. So presume in most of these cases, but not all, and uh, read newsroom to find out which ones are the exceptions. In most of these cases, the commissioner of crown lands has given consent for this development. So to, to see one type of this intensification of crown land, um, here's an irrigation pipeline that's going in um, just next to the shores of Lake Kukaki. Um, so it's, it's slated to, to go through, and it's actually starting already to go through um, Simon's Pass, Pastoral Lease, and the bit of that that's uh, going to go into conservation land. So this pipeline here is going through conservation land. It's not there yet, but it's getting there. So then you think, then the next question becomes, OK, the, that first question that I asked back in whenever it was, 2006, OK, so the Crown's selling land, so how much money is, are they making? And this is where you've got to prepare to be, be confused. So in, in the Mackenzie Basin, the Crown has shifted 60,000 hectares into conservation. So basically, they've bought the grazing rights off of 60,000 hectares, um, and they've sold the freehold to 90,000 hectares. Um, and for the 60,000 hectares that have gone into conservation land, the Crown bought pastoral grazing rights uh, from the previous run holders for $45 million. Okay. <coughs> So for the 90,000 hectares of new freehold land, the ex run holders bought that for $36 million. So on balance, the Crown paid the Mackenzie farmers $9 million. <coughs> if you expand that to the whole of the South Island, the Crown has paid the farmers upwards of $60 million. So I found this quite surprising, and I still find it quite surprising, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the the crown is freeholding the most productive bits and more productive land is generally worth more than less productive land the crown is generally also freeholding the lake lake shore lakeside bits and land on lake shores is generally worth more than higher altitude land above lake shores freehold is generally worth more than leasehold and 90,000 hectares is usually worth more than 60,000 hectares so, you know, go figure. <clears throat> and 
if you're confused, and I see quite a few of you sort of furrowing your, your brow there, and that means that you actually understand it quite clearly because it just doesn't make sense. These outcomes didn't make sense in 2006, and they still don't make sense. And to make matters even worse, we have, um, we've tracked what happens to the land after it, after it gets freeholded, after it gets privatized. And um, in the Mackenzie, about a tenth of the new freehold land has on sold for $27,000, uh, $27 million, sorry, $27 million. So what a tenth of what the run holders got paid $9 million to take has on sold for $27 million. And if you, if you expand that to the, um, to the South Island, all of the South Island, the new freehold um, on sells for about 500 times what the Crown sold it for. So there you have it. That's about the um, amount of difference I've made in South Island High Country. Here is an advertisement for a new subdivision on former Crown land just next to Twizel. So if you're confused about this, that means that you understand. Um, and, but the thing is, is that this isn't farmer's greed. It's not sort of corporate malfeasance or anything like that. This, this is government decisions that we're talking about. And it's been government decisions for 25 years. And it's been government decisions of labor governments and national governments and district and regional councils. So, you know, the fate of the Mackenzie you know, is in our hands, but unfortunately we have met the enemy and he is us because we're the ones doing this. So, chirpy antichrist though I may be, um, I'd like to conclude by sharing with you a few of the lessons that I've learned about politics from buildings and the high country. First of all, I'd say that as a person, you've got to choose your battles carefully because they might go on for a while. There's a, an optimum ratio between sleeping, trying, and failing. If you try but fail, you've still got to be able to sleep. So some battles will be too difficult and too painful to even start. But the battles you need to fight are those where you can't count on sleeping if you fail to try. There's a big difference between failing to try um, and trying but failing. It's okay to, to fail as long as you try, but failing to try, that's, that's less okay. And ability to sleep lies in the balance between the two. I also learned that the little guy can make a difference and MPs do listen occasionally but that's only if, the little, if we little guys team up strategically and play all the cards we've got and play them very, very well. Because the decks are stacked against us, little guys. And again, it's not due to corporate greed or government malfeasance. The decks are stacked against the little guy just due to power imbalances. This is basic economics and political science 101. Private interests that want to avoid retrofitting or want to develop the Mackenzie will always be stronger than the public interest behind safety or protection. It's a basic truth of politics that the few defeat the many with regularity. So you've got to take all of this into account in calculating your ratios of trying, failing, and sleeping. When you try for a public interest change in policy, it's quite likely that you will fail. But that likelihood should make it easier to sleep if and when you do fail. But to make a difference, you've got to overcome what's called the collective action problem. A small group of people who stand to gain financially from an irrigation pipeline on the shores of Lake Pukaki will always, nearly always win over a much larger less defined and more diffuse group of people who oppose it. Why? It's called the, the free rider problem. Um, and to understand a free rider problem, you have to think of a group of mice and a cat. All the mice want the bell on that cat. But when the mice meet to decide who's going to put the 
fell on the cat, no mouse volunteers. Because when all mice benefit equally from the, the bell, which mouse is going to volunteer to, put, to be the poor sucker to put the bell on the cat? It's much easier and much more rational to be a free rider on another mouse's bravery. So that's why public goods, um, like retrofitting buildings or um, environmental protection, often lose out to corporate greed. It's not because the corporates are greedy. It's because the advocates for the public good of the bell on the cat failed to overcome the collective action problem. So then the question becomes, well, how do you overcome the collective action problem? Theory offers a couple of suggestions, but I'll just mention two. First, you've got to use every tool uh, that you can to think, of, to think of ways to tie your issue to broader issues. Tie it to national security, to health, to babies, to equity, and use symbols and stories and words and images to, to make your image seem broader. Make it clear that what you want is in the public interest, you know, like babies and health. Well, what the other side wants is only in their interest. But when you distinguish between the public interest and the narrow self-interest, be very careful to avoid sanctimony and condescension. Because your goal is to bring people on sides with you, not just to make the other side look selfish. So your goal is not to define what self-interest is, but to define the public interest. And as soon as you can frame the conversation such that your vision for the world is the accepted public interest, you've started to win the battle. But you've got another collective action problem, and this one is internal. To combat it, you've got to look inside and think carefully about what you do to promote your cause. In the world of politics, holding an idea privately and expounding on it at cocktail parties is not enough. In politics, only public actions and public statements count. You might make a few people angry, I certainly have, but life is not a popularity contest. Take it from me, even the chirpy antichrist has some friends. So here's the thing, parliamentarians and regional councillors and governments respond to public statements, not private sentiments. If you believe something, you've got to state it publicly, don't just believe it. And whatever you do, don't wait for someone else to say it for you, because that's just chicken. If you believe in something, but are content to let someone else say it for you, you're, you're hurting your own interest in several ways. First of all, you diminish, you diminish that someone else's power. You make him or her look like a heretic, all alone in their heretical beliefs. And also, you diminish your own power. You make your own beliefs look extremist, therefore easier for governments to ignore. So private sentiments but public silence achieves nothing. So the biggest obstacle you've got to getting a public interest change is collective action. How to over overcome it? You've got to be strong and be brave and never ever apologize for what you believe in. Don't free ride on other people's bravery and you've got to communicate your vision and not wait for someone else to do it for you. Others might not share your vision, they probably won't, and they might even hate you, but we're all adults and we, we will get over it. So in the high country, I learned that you've, got to, you've just got to speak the truth as you see it, early and often, clearly and concisely. In the building's journey, through two rounds of parliamentary select hearings, I learned a few more concrete tidbits that are worth sharing. First of all, there's no peer review for the Scoop website. Um, if you want to put something up on Scoop, go right ahead. I, early on, I saw someone else um, I saw a press release that I really did fundamentally disagreed with about buildings. I thought, I wonder how they got that up there. And so I spiffed up my submission to Parliament and sent it into to Scoop, and up it went. And soon after that, I, a few other people had seen it, and they, they went and put their bits of my submission into their submission. And, and so, yeah, just make it look like an official media release, and Scoop will take it. Um, and from that, I also learned that 
uh, sharing draft submissions is a really good idea. Uh, there's no peer review and no plagiarism rules in, in submitting. Um, the more people who expound your ideas, the better. Um, and also, I learned that newspapers don't always have the same originality standards that academic journals do. If you work hard on a submission to Parliament, it's well worth working just a little bit harder to uh, send it to a newspaper or, I mean, nowadays it's more about websites and and um, blog sites, but it's well worth sending it to the media in whatever form it takes. Um, and you know, if you just happen to send it to a couple of media sites at the same time, well, it's up to them whether they publish it or not. Um, and when it comes to presenting to select committee, uh, be warned that the staff will instruct you not to repeat what's in your submission. And that really threw me. But what they mean is not what they say. What they mean is don't read your submission word for word, just go over it, sort of the greatest hits of it, and summarize it. And throughout both, but especially through the, the building's um, journey, it, I have to say it felt quite uncomfortable to purport to know the way forward for the nation. It felt quite arrogant and presumptuous, because who was I to impose my will on the nation? But the thing is, is that other people are going to impose their will, and it's well within my and your rights to do the same. In the end, it's up to Parliament to decide, just like it's up to the newspapers whether they want to publish your, your um, opinion piece or not. So it's not you imposing your will on the nation, it's just you asking Parliament to consider your vision for the world as they take their decision. And people often say that politics is a game or politics should get out of the way of good governance. But, you know, they taught us at Berkeley that politics is not a game and it never gets out of the way. It's the way of the world. It, in order to be effective citizens of the world, we've got to understand politics. It's a competition of ideas and visions and values. Um, you've got to put your vision out there and you've got to state it clearly and state it strongly. You've got to be honest and be blunt. Do not use the passive voice and always use short sentences. Because big words and long sentences don't impress people, it just confuses them. Um, avoid hinting at something in the hopes of being clever. It's not clever, it's just cryptic. And you got to remember that you know your issue better than anyone else. So don't be subtle. Because this is your vision for the world. So you should state it proudly, but not smugly. You also need to remember that politics is an exercise in strategic hypocrisy. You shouldn't be afraid to change your position or state things maybe a little bit too confidently or a little bit too simply. <laughs> but you should just be strategic about it. Because hypocritical or not, politics is all about communicating your vision for the world. Use every tool you've got. Stories, words, symbols, numbers, metaphors, all of it. You might wish to take this as a call to arms, but I'll leave that up to you. I will say that it is you who creates your world. Others will shape the world according to their vision, so it's your right and your responsibility, perhaps, to at least try to shape the world according to your vision. I'm not here to tell you what your vision for the world should be. I just tried to share a few ideas about how to implement your vision. So when you receive your call to arms, which I'm sure you will one day, whatever that call may be, I hope that you can be strong and be brave, never give up, Never apologize, never take no for an answer, and always remember what Margaret Mead said, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
questions, comments, thoughts? Um, did everybody hear the question? Okay. It's, a, it's so about it's a question. Oh, yeah. Do you, you go ahead. Well, it's about how how to how I've dealt with and how to deal with civil servants. Well, I will say that I'm a big fan of yes minister and yes prime minister, and um, uh, uh, civil servants have a lot of power in. Um, parliamentary democracies, and um, they are often, not always, but often quite resistant to change. Um, so um, I can't say I've been terrifically successful at, at um, dealing with civil servants. Um, but in terms of, yeah. Gosh, that's a tough one because that, you know, hell hath no fury like a recalcitrant civil servant. Um, <laughs> um, I do think that um, sometimes going straight to the minister, often the minister will be at odds with the civil servant, just like yes, minister um, depicted. Um, I have had the experience of of ministers, so civil servants saying, no, we will not release the data about who paid who, how much money. They de declined that for years, but then the minister rang and said, oh, would you mind just asking me that question? Um, so sometimes the ministers want change more than the civil servants do, so you got to sort of um, figure out which, which one is on their, your side, because it's not likely that both will be. So they're often at odds, those two. In my question, I think this was about the question about who you met. I've been involved in the past few months, and one thing that becomes very clear very fast is that that small group of interested parties, like developers or whatever, they have a lot of um, highly talented people that are funded to spend days and days sitting through the government meetings and doing all the work that your, your public activist people have to do sort of on a pro bono basis alongside their actual jobs. Um, you know, and presumably that's one of the factors here that comes into your comment on that determination of the target to be required. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the high country is a perfect story of that, where um, you've got all of these farms all around the high country where the farmer is quite rightly very interested in the outcome and and has a, a vested financial interest in the outcome. So as you say, can afford to pay lawyers and economists and accountants to um, to, to fight the, the long haul, whereas the public interest groups have to fight the long haul on all 306 pastoral leases around up and down the South Island. So you've got one divided by one strength on, um, on any given pastoral lease, but you've got one divided by 306 on the other side. So yeah, it's just the decks are stacked against the little guy, and that's just another way that, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't look good for us, sorry. And firstly, thank you for making a difference for all New Zealanders by standing up and taking on a challenge when it would be fair to say for a lot of us that went through what you did on that day, you could have moved on with your life, but you realised that you could make a difference, and you did make a difference. And it, no matter how many words appear in the changes, it's hugely important, and I thank you, and I'm sure everybody else thanks you for making New Zealand and the buildings that we walk under a little bit safer.
But my next question, working in public relations and advocacy and lobbying and working with governments and councils is simply this. Do you, do you actually think we've learned a great deal from this earthquake when you consider recently there was a derailment in Auckland and it was alleged that Shonky Steel came into this country. Now, we were fortunate, unlike the CTV tragedy, that people were shaken up in that derailment and there wasn't a loss of life, but there could have been. And there's many other examples. There's buildings and civil construction throughout New Zealand that may well have that shonky steel waiting for another seismic event. I'm just wondering if, in your experience, you believe we've actually learnt, if the government officials and the councils have actually learnt anything from this earthquake. Well, that's, that's a pretty tough question. Um, I, I think buildings are, you know, like Sarah was asking about, um, give an example of, of that, that type of collective action failure in the high country. You've just given two good examples of regulatory failure in sort of buildings and, and infrastructure. You know, regulatory failures happen all the time. That's why economics exists. Um, and, and that's what it's, it's all about. So I don't think it's, I think it's a little bit unfair to say just beca because there's another regulatory failure here, it means we've ne learned nothing. There's always going to be regulatory failures. Um, but we little guys have to keep keep vigilant about it. Because another thing I learned in the high country is that um, so when the, the minister changed the rules about the high country, everybody, you know, champagne corks were popped and, and then everybody moved on. And the, the, your recalcitrant bureaucrats went straight back to doing things, privatizing the, um, the most the lakeshore bits, basically doing exactly what the new rules told them they weren't supposed to be doing. Um, and meanwhile, the, the environmentalists were too busy with the champagne to notice. So um, I do think that there's always going to be regulatory failures, um, and that's to be expected. But if the little guy um, and the public re remain vigilant, we might have some chance of, of catching them up in it. Hi, my name's Nikki. I have a URM in High Street. Do you know that there are a number of building owners in High Street who have done nothing for seven and a half years, who have until 2033 before they need to actually strengthen and repair their buildings? It's depressing. Yeah, I, I know nothing about that. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm afraid your battle and my battle hasn't finished. <laughs> Two questions back there. Mm -hmm. Just wait for the microphone. I don't think people are going to hear you down here. Yeah, I'd just uh, like to reiterate uh, thank you for your uh, speech uh, this evening. But I worked for the uh, business that actually imported the um, product for the irrigation in, in the high country there at a cost of $23 million coming from a business called Superlit in Turkey. And um, you touched um, a little bit on... Um, the uh, sense of it being about money. And I firmly believe, I was quite shocked actually by the detail that you gave there of how land use has changed. And this will um, significantly make those changes. This is one of probably four projects in the South Island. So there's Rakaia, North Canterbury Plains, and this scheme here of many, many millions. So my question to you is, even though you didn't, you said it wasn't about the money or the corporate greed necessarily, I believe that's quite the opposite. I think it's all about the money. And um, I'm just wondering, in your connections with politicians, whether or not they sort of play on the knife edge, as it were. It's like a bit of a boys club. What are your thoughts when you're connecting with politicians and 
counsel people when you're talking vast sums of money like this one? Well, um, I, I do agree that it, it, there, is, there is a lot, um, a lot of it is about money. I guess what my point about it not being about money is that's not the reason why the decks are stacked against the little guy. That's more about power imbalances. Um, but in terms of, of where the councils and um, politicians stand at the moment, I obviously can't speak for them, but it is a new government. Um, and so, you know, maybe the high country will change. You know, maybe this will be the year that I get to find a new research topic. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so the environment court said that it should stop about a year ago, but your recalcitrant bureaucrats within a month were proposing new, um, new freeholding deals. Yes, Anne. Um, why, any theories on why the last Labour government didn't do more to uh, adjust tenure review to prevent uh, what you've unravelled? Um, is this because of lack of public concern? Was that one factor? I think there uh, was a lot of that. Uh, I do think that um, the it's much more sort of standard, like the standard story, oh yeah, tenure review is a ripoff. Now, in 2018, that's pretty well known. It was front page, it's been front page news in the press and on newsroom for, for years now. But um, in 2008, there, there was a lot of um, private sentiment that it was a ripoff and that maybe it should stop, but there wasn't much public statement about it. Um, and that could be why, because the minister was, he, the then minister of lands, now minister for the environment, has said um, that the single best thing, best and cheapest thing we can do for New Zealand's environment is to stop tenure review. But they haven't done it yet, again, so who knows. I'm waiting. Um, it, well, two ways. One is uh, to the Minister of Lands and Conservation, who for the first time in 25 years is the same person. The last time that the, the Minister of Lands and Conservation were the same person was when they started Tenure Review. Um, and second of all, if you're diligent, you can dig through the public notices that say when each, each and every one of these 306 um, mind-numblingly boring um, documents about the proposals to freehold new land, if you're really diligent, you can dig through and comment on those. But uh, again, hearkening back to the first question about the recalcitrant bureaucrats, I'd go to the minister. Right, thank you very much, Anne. I'm going to... Do you think the ministers are genuinely concerned, or is it just politically expedient to say, oh, these reviews are really going to do this? There's very little about the high country that Eugenie Sage does not know. So she is, yeah, she's absolutely onto it. Great. Now, people are leaving, so I really am going to draw a close to the formal questions, but Anne may be willing to take further questions if you come up to the front. Will you please join me in thanking Anne for two things tonight? <laughs> um, if you join me in thanking her for her lecture, in thanking her for the action she's, the commitment she's shown for the New Zealand public, and also please congratulate her for her award she received today. Thank you.